All right, let's talk about the, yeah, let's look at the plan, the schedule on, on the website. And the first of four, four weeks, we have been working on the ESP32 CAM. And so I have received all your PCB design files. So I will probably find some time to upload everything tonight. Um, just a reminder, if you didn't include that drill file in your cover file, please do it and then send it to me again. Um, that's an important file. And we are going to cover the sensors, actuators. It's kind of important because if you have never used it, whenever you got an engineering problem, you don't know which sensor you want to pick up, right? It's, it's critical. So we'll have, uh, I think I have uh, four PowerPoint slides with some pretty minor calculations for some of the sensors if it's necessary, and a few assignments as well. And Friday, no class, it's a break, college wide. And next week, we'll do some calculations for the power supplies uh, regarding the adapters, AC to DC, DC to DC, voltage boosters, buck converters, boost converters, things like that. And then joysticks, is one lecture and I think I probably will give you a little bit more time to work on that in the lab. So joysticks is the one I probably have showed you. It's a uh, nothing but just a potential meter on the four directions. If you push it vertically or on the Y direction, it's gonna change the resistance. So it's an analog uh, joystick, it's not a digital one. So the output is nothing but just a resistor resistance change. Uh, there are some digital um, joysticks as well. Uh, you know, you have to part it up and then whenever it's being, the value is being changed by this uh, little knob, uh, it's directly outputting like I2C or SPI. So these signals, you know, they are occupying more uh, GPIO resource if you need to use I2C somewhere else. So the Still bit, you know, joystick has to occupy that I2C just, you know, for a little actuator, it's not making sense. I, I prefer uh, using this potential meter version, actually. It's cheaper as well. It works pretty, pretty well. The reason we have to get this done is because it's being used to control the two-wheel balancing robot. So which is this one? Uh, I will give you probably two to three lectures and give you the time for the following weeks to get it done in the lab. <clears throat> and following that is a machine learning for anomaly detection project using ESP32. Uh, this is from a engineer working for, um, used to work for Spotify, now DigiKey. You probably have watch the, some of his tutorial videos, pretty fun person, fun, funny person. I mean, um, he has uploaded a lot of very good tutorial, tutorials. You cannot find these resource in any textbooks. I think these are super valuable and can give you a lot of experience with uh, one of the most popular microcontrollers on this market right now. And they're real-time systems um, for our, our toss, things like that. Okay, that's the plan for this semester. And you have designed one PCB. I didn't, uh, I didn't let you to design, redesign all these P, uh, components on the PCB. I directly just let you, you know, use the commercial modules uh, because that's the first PCB. Some of you guys have never uh, done the PCB in the past. So I don't want to make it too difficult, but the second one will be more complicated. It's going to be the balancing robot and you wanna, uh, but the back controller is simple. It's just a uh, Mega 32P, 320, 328P, sorry, 320, 320, um, 328P. So 28 pins, DIP version. Uh, the PCB is not difficult at all. Let's see if there's an example somewhere. Okay, so I didn't, actually I didn't draw the PCB by myself, right? 
but whatever on this board, uh, you, you are going to be asked to convert these things to a PCB board, right? So there will be two PCBs. One is for the car and another one is for the controller. So the controller will, uh, you have to mount the joysticks. Um, so the joysticks need a mount controller itself as well. And battery, cartridges, right? So all these things will be on the, on the controller. So last time we didn't make a really fancy, you know, controller PCB. Everything was still scattered on the table uh, with a remote, you know, some of the components are still on the breadboard. So this time, prefer since I, I hired a person, uh, not Peterson, you know, he, he, he has been working on the 3D printing, making the 3D printing tutorials for me. Uh, so that's just for you guys, actually. So he will create a, a series of tutorials of using that 3D printer in my lab. And also I bought three additional 3D printers. I will have space in uh, Burnhole 670 uh, to host these uh, better 3D printers. So you guys will have uh, um, more than three, I guess. Maybe what is it? four. So totally four 3D printers. Um, to print out all the all the parts. So these ones are not printed. These the board is being cut in the shop. So there are some adapters to the wheels, you know, the little brackets to hold the battery cells. All these little tiny parts are going to be 3D printed, uh, including the panel. I don't even have a design right now, so you guys will come up with a design. So I'm gonna expecting for the entire class. Um, it's not an individual project. We have eight people. So it's going to be four groups, so two per two people per team, and um, you will find out like what kind of tasks for for whom whom to work on, right? Like thirty printing, PCB board drawing, you know, um, digital design, coding, like who should work on which, be in charge of which part of the project, and uh, eventually we need a formal presentation on your design. So, because last time it was the first time to do this project, um, you know, the most of the time was spent on uh, solving the technical issues, and now we can, you know, focus more on the en uh, engineering design part, like how to make it look like a product we can sell. I mean, things like that. Since I I have more uh, documentations and more uh, experience with this robot. Um, that I can provide to you guys. So hopefully you can get it done faster compared to last time. <clears throat> okay, come back to this week. You know, presentations for sensors and actuators. I have a couple slides to show you guys these things. <clears throat> so the purpose is, you know, after, if I just directly uh, read through all these slides, I think you guys probably still won't be able to directly tell someone, like, which sensor, which actuator you should use in the engineering environment. For example, you are uh, doing, uh, you are on the team of a senior son project, and you are managing the C component on this project. It's been happening a lot, right? Like Michael, for example, you're working on the C part of the bridge remote sensing. And they will ask you, like, I want to uh, sense that uh, distance from the bridge to the water level and what type of sensor you're going to use, right? There are so many different types of sensors. Um, and which one we want to use, right? Considering the environment and power consumption and also the distance, real distance needs to be sensed. So there, there might not there there are many options for uh, distance sensing, but for this specific application, maybe there are only like one or two or three, not too many. Um, if you do the down selection, so uh, you can see many. There are several examples online that are using uh, ultrasonic sensors to do that. Uh, I think which is fine if you can find a, a good one, or you know lidar. Um, a light sensor 
will work as well. Right? So, but except for the distance sensing, there are many other situations um, in the engineering environment. And let's see what are these sensors on Twitter you want to pick up. Situations. So it's a dynamic, uh, Boston dynamic spot, right? Start being sold last year or two years ago. How much was that? Did you pay attention to it at all? A hundred thousand close to that. I think it's like seventy thousand dollars or something. If you add more sensor and more functions, probably will be a hundred thousand dollars. And uh, you can tell there are many sensors and actuators are working together. You know, um, you definitely need a more than one CPU sometimes to communicate with the sensor actuators. Um, so definitely you need an operating system on that Mac controller. So Arduino cannot work. You need a better Mac controller, which has a larger RAM to host that RTOS, right? Real-time operating system. And we'll have some examples later this semester to work on that. Uh, so because there are many interrupts to be handled. Um, So common sensors, transducers, actuators. Light sensing, okay. Light dependent resistor. Photodiode, phototransistor, star cell. So as an electrical computer engineer, if I just uh, list all these things, do you have any ideas in your mind? Like what are they and what are what they are being used? And why they are being used? What are the applications, the typical ones for them? So which, so for the ones who have taken my, so most of you guys were in my 351, right? If you have time, just take it next screen. So we covered a lot of, we used a lot of sensors, actuators in that, <clears throat> in that class. So did we use a light dependent resistor anywhere? Have you used that? Give me an example. So I can feel better. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of heartbreaking. We have done this at least uh, once or twice. No, that's that's a transceiver. That's an IR transceiver. But it's, a, it's not a resistor, though. Yeah. PID control. You recall that? This little thing. So that's the LDR. Okay. Light dependent resistor. So quick quiz question. If this guy is being placed in a very bright environment, is it going to be a low resistance or high resistance? Low resistance. If there's no light, it's not temperature. It's not sensing temperature. It's sensing light. Okay. So if this guy is placed in the so if if you have a super bright environment illuminated really well, then the resistance of this guy is super low, like a short circuit, like a wire. If it's placed in a dark environment, it's like one megaohm. Okay, so that's the LDR. See, you know, the, I mean, you, you, you have learned how to use it, you know, for one tutorial and you forgot it, understandable. So as an educator, my, part of my job is to repeat it. So you guys can, can definitely remember it, right? When, whenever you, you get a job, they're asking you like, what kind of sensor you want to use for this engineering problem. You can directly tell them this, 
or that, right? And why? That's critical. Photo dialed. So what is a photo dialed? So first it is a dialed, right? Is that an LED? So what is LED? What does LED mean? Light emission dialed, right? So if you give a paper. LED is a doubt and you positive uh, you uh, forward bias it right so if you give a higher potential at the anode of the doubt and the lower potential at the um, castle so this is being forward biased and there will be a current flow through it Okay, and for the LEDs, they are being positively, they are being forward biased, like the normal LED. But the only difference is it's just being fabricated in a, using different per size, so different materials. So it's gonna emit light whenever there is a, a current flow through it, right? But for photo dialed, it's also a dial. But it's being reverse biased. Which means the castle is being connected to a higher potential and here is being connected to a lower potential. So the photo dial, instead of emitting light, it receives light. So whenever it receives light, it's gonna induce. If we know that whenever the dial is being reverse biased, there won't be any current flows through the uh, in that direction, right? That's the purpose of the doubt. It's only conduct current in one direction. It's gonna block anything flowing from the right to the left for this case. But now if you reverse bias it and there won't be any significant amount of current, there will probably be some leakage or something flowing from the top to the bottom. But the thing is whenever it receives light, Going to convert that photon energy of the photon into electrical currents so it's going to make this guy more conductive and whenever you get more light it has more current flows through the photo, photo from the doubt uh, from the castle to the anode and that's called photo current so now the current the current is a signal because you have converted that light intensity into the current intensity. So now the current is a signal. I have to convert the current into a voltage. How to do that? And why do we want to convert current, the current to voltage? That's the first question, right? Why do we want to convert current to voltage? Keep in mind, as an engineer, you have to know the workflow to design the embedded system. And the starting point is a, is an analog signal, right? So the analog signal comes in, you need a you need to know what kind of sensor you want to use. And what kind of ADC you want to use. So now here's the analog environment signal, which is the light. And being received by the photo dial, and it induces photo current, which is a very weak current from the top to the bottom. And you want to convert into voltage. So the first question is why voltage? Because next to it, we're going to have an ADC. ADC is the analog to digital converter, right? You can buy the off shelf of the shelf parts. Like only two dollars, you can get a like twelve bit ADC. Or you can use Arduino and use the analog pin, analog inputs. 
A0, for example. So what is, how many bits do you have for the ADC in the Arduino chip? Remember that? So you have forgotten everything. Yeah, so how many bits do you have for the ADC in Arduino? 10. Why? Remember, when you connect everything to A0, you are getting a 1023. Why? Because this is 2 to the 10th minus 1. So that's the largest number you can get digitally because it's a 10 bit ADC. If you're not using the Arduino's ADC, which is not really a good ADC, and you want to use the individual IC ADC for microchip or AD devices, analog devices, that company, you can get a 12-bit, 14-bit, or 14-bit ADC, which has a way higher resolution. So way better performance. And now you want to digitize this light signal. All right? You've got an ADC. So what this ADC is converting is able to convert a current. So now if you have designed or simulated the star ADC we have used, and you know that ADCs are all converting analog voltages to a digital version of the voltage, but not current. So we're not, so the circuits humans have developed in this recent like 60 years, all these circuits are very good at converting voltages, not currents. So we are not handling currents at all. Keep in mind. That's why everything, every single sensor eventually are being converted. So the environment, environmental signal are being converted into voltage. Keep in mind, voltage, 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 always voltage. Why? Because ADCs are accepting voltages, not currents. So the ultrasonic sensor for distance sensing. Yeah, ultrasonic sensor is a transducer, right? And what's this, what was the transducer doing? The piezoelectric material. Whenever there's a pressure applied to that little device, it appears it's going to show up a little voltage difference. If this is a piezoelectric material, right? You hit it, boom, voltage. You give a pressure voltage. Okay? You have an ultrasonic or sound signal, hit it, voltage. The so ultrasound device in the hospital, the radiology used, you know, the transducer, the little probe they used, same thing. It's a trans ultrasonic transducer. So whatever being received, the sound, boom, voltage. All right, same thing here. You've got a current you want to convert into voltage. What do you want to do for this guy? So what's happening? Keep in mind, that's a specific circuit. For photo, uh, for a photo dial. So what what's, what this one? What is this one doing here? And what is this called? Yes, inverting configuration, right? It's an inverting op amp. Operational amplifier, OPAM for short. But here, it's not called inverting configuration of the OPAM. It is called TIA. So what does TIA mean? Trans impedance. Amplifier. Transimpedance amplifier. The reason the name is transimpedance amplifier is because it's converting current into voltage. And how that works. <clears throat> so 
So if I ground the, in, the non-inverting terminal, what's the voltage here? Ground as well. Because of the super high open loop gain, right? It's fine if you forgot it in circuit one, if, or they may probably didn't even teach it. But anyway, so if this is an op-amp operational amplifier, it has a super high open loop gain. So that's why this one is zero, and this one is also zero. It's called virtual ground. It's not physically grounded, but the voltage here is zero. So what's going to happen is whenever the light hits the, this photodiode, it's going to induce a photocurrent. So the current is going to flow in that way. Okay, and current flows through R1 will give you a voltage drop. And the thing is, there's no current flow in or out from the op-amp because of high impedance input. So the current actually flows from here to here, like this. So I times R1, Will be the voltage from here to here okay and vo over rf because vo minus zero is still vo y minus zero because the voltage here is zero and the current is not going to anywhere except for this pass so current flows through this rf you know will give you a voltage drop as well and that voltage drop exactly vo so this one equals to i as well so the same i we don't have to care about this one for now, but just this one. And now let me know what's the gain here. And let me know if the gain is high or low. For example, RF is 1K. So what is the gain? So gain means when you calculate the gain, you use the output divided by the input. So the input is I, is a photo current, which is I being induced by the photo dial, and the gain will be the output over the input. And what is that? It's interesting, right? You have never used the voltage divided by current to get a gain. Usually, you use the voltage divided by voltage to get the voltage gain, right? Or current gain, but now it's different. So here's the input, here's the output. So according to this one, what is V over I? You got lost. What is V over I from this equation? RF. And you can have RF to be 1K, 10K, 100K. And RF will be the gain. So is the gain high or low? It's actually very high. The resistor is usually just you can pick up like 100k, and the gain will be 100k. The thing is, it's not a voltage amplifier. Amplifying, uh, it's a trans impedance amplifier. Okay? Trans impedance because, you know, it's getting an impedance gain here. Anyway, but, you know, when you have a photo doubt, something shows up in your mind should be a trans impedance amplifier to convert that current into the voltage and then ADC. So that's the regular photo dial. You can actually buy a photo dial from the, some of the optics labs online and being used in the optical, you know, for example, the seal border optics labs. They have a lot of photo dial sensors. Um, and they can directly buy an amplifier and make the connections and read the result into a, a lab view, you know, lab view. But as a computer engineer, we usually do not use lab view, right? If you need a GUI, just build it yourself. <laughs> just write a C++ code and build it, or Python, just do it yourself. You don't need a lab view. It's for non-engineering non people, usually. Um, so... Yeah, photo doubt, you need a trans impedance, then ADC. Clear? 
photo photo transistor. I'm going to show you some of the pictures pretty soon. Photo transistor. <laughs> so where have we used a photo transistor? Let's take a look. This time, that's a line follower car, actually. Let's come back. <clears throat> uh, is it here? Oh, probably not here, though. It's in my tool one. This one. And this guy. What is this? So that's an IR transceiver, remember? You used it for the line follower. And one, so what is this one? And what is this one? So that's a photo dial. Uh, no, no, that's an LED. This, this guy emits IR, infrared light, not like visible. You couldn't see it. You have to see it. Under a Samsung camera, <laughs> you couldn't actually visualize it. So that's an LED, and that's a phototransistor. And the reason it's a transistor is because it has three terminals, not two. So that's a phototransistor. So whenever this guy receives light, it's going to short these two terminals together. So whenever there's a light being received, and the resistance between these two points are very low. That's how you send, send the light signal. Okay. That's a phototransistor. Server cell. Okay, it's very common, regular. You can see find it everywhere. Server couple we have used in I'm a net lab. It's a little it's just two metal materials. We have a voltage difference appear and um, at the two terminals. Did you use the amplifier to read it? The thermal couple experiment, if you have done that, did you do that? How do how do you read the temperature? How do you read the voltage? Oh, lab view. Is there a AD converter or DAC or yeah, data acquisition good. board? But is it is that being preamplified because the voltage is voltage signal is very low? So the DAC probably will do the job. Okay. So thermal couple is one of the uh, temperature sensors we have used. Uh, we we haven't used, but you know, you have used, right? And uh, thermal, thermal, uh, thermistor. Have we have we used a thermistor? What's a thermistor? Fine, I'll just repeat it. Thermistor is gas is here. The little black dot. Remember. I've used no it's thermistor is a temperature sensor this one you have to use the equation to calculate it so this little thing it's not very accurate so for some of the environment does not need the accurate temperature um, I think it's totally fine to just use a thermistor since it's super low cost and small, right? Okay, that's a thermistor. So that specific material need uh, this equation uh, to convert that resistance into a temperature, right? Okay, that's a thermistor and thermostat it's not a individual sensor right it just has a little controller in there whenever it's too high you want to cool it down it's a it's a system thermostat it's a system resistive temperature detectors this is a very similar to a thermistor okay so these are for temperature sensing and I will have a few slides and we'll take a, a period of time to directly just uh, introduce 
all different temperature sensors. There are so many different types of temperature sensors you, you can you can select. And so it's good to know the pros and cons for each one. So whenever you are trying to measure temperature, you know which one you want to use. It's actually not everyone, uh, for example, a thermistor. So the, for the project I did for uh, Progosa Spring, the hot tubs, and that one requires something to be plugged into the pool. So thermistor definitely cannot work because uh, you cannot totally seal that two pins, the two wires. So there will be shorted in, 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 in the water. So I have to use something can be sealed and can be enclosed in a um, thermal conductive environment, a little um, package. Yeah, so I will, I will give you some examples uh, regarding that kind of environment, what kind of temperature sensor you want to use. And also for, for distance, you cannot imagine that you have a one thermistor and have a super long wire. I mean, you have to seal all the metal wires along the way, you know, and then um, connect it to a metal controller somewhere, right? Because uh, there are 24 uh, hot tubs on the, on the resort, resort, resort. And um, so the tubs are, you know, pretty close by to each other. Um, you have to have, have a cable, actually. It, per, per, um, it's better to, to have a, use a digital signal to communicate between the map controller and the sensor. Um, because you have a pretty long cable, then a very low voltage will be changed by the noise or by the long distance because there is introducing a lot of resistance to the wire. Um, so it's better to digitize everything at the very beginning and then send the digital signal out. To sense force and pressure. <clears throat> What's the, what are the sensors available? String gauge. Did you do string, string gauge in M9? String gauge. So we'll have experiment with string gauges, with a string gauge. <clears throat> Position, potential meters, encoders. I have a lot of experiments with, with encoders. And re reflective slotted optical switches pretty close to encoders. LVDT as well. It's a position sensor uh, being used in a very harsh environment because they are um, uh, very tough sensors, right? Speed. Sensors, sound sensors. So that's the LVDT. Okay. The way it works is it connects a um, AC signal to the primary side, and whenever the core is being pulled or pushed. You know, because the, the core is being hooked to a to the to the device to be measured, right? And whenever this core, the position of the core is being changed, it's being pulled, and the output current or voltage will be changed because the uh, magnetic field inside the sensor uh, is changed. So now, I just think about it, right? If you have LVDT and our one Arduino board. How do you make it work? Right? Very simple question. So because if you look at this diagram, you know that if I put a bar, it's gonna change the output. So I got a signal. Okay? But how do you use it? How do you make it work? <clears throat> So I drew a diagram like this last, uh, from last year. Let's see if that makes sense. So before you look at this diagram, right, just think about it. I give you a LVDT. It's very simple. You pull it or just push it to the end, right? It won't definitely won't allow you to pull it forever, right? If you pull it, it's going to stop at some point. 
and you connect the input just through terminals to a voltage. And then when you pull it, you see, hey, there's a voltage change when I pull and push like this. I can see the voltage change um, on the oscilloscope. You can show it. But how do you use that change and convert it into a distance? So if we connect everything like this, so Arduino has a 10-bit ADC. And at the very beginning, I just pull it whenever it stops, right? Pull it to the maximum output value. And then I uh, measure it. Um, Wait, uh, pull the core to the maximum and it's just a potential meter to get you the this signal output. So have two, three resistors here and one potential meter is a 100K potential meter in the middle and two 1K resistors on the top and bottom. So what's the function, what's the function of these two resistors? So still, whenever you, the potential meter is uh, point it to here or here, you still have a little resistance, right? It's not directly giving you a lot of voltage. That making sense? So for example, you got a 10 volts output. All right. So 10, 10 volts will be the maximum output. And the maximum input, the Arduino pins can receive is the 5 volts. And in that case, <clears throat> if this guy is a potential meter is shorted, the two terminals are shorted, like there's nothing for the potential meter. You still have two 1Ks. You're still dividing this 10 volts into two halves, right? So it's still getting less than 5 volts. So that's one thing. I just want a two resistor to protect the circuit. It's not burning your Arduino. That's the first thing. Second, it's a voltage divider, is it? Even though these two are tiny, but the 100K, whenever you are changing, you are moving this wiper it's a it's going to divide this this voltage to some point and whenever you pull it to the maximum value and you adjust that potential meter to make it right at 1023 because of the 10 bit it's a 10 bit my controller and whenever you get that one and you can find out the maximum uh, displacement from the data sheet, for example, is 10 centimeters, and just calibrate that 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter um, to this value, right? So whenever it's a 10 centimeter, you got 1023. So the 10 centimeter range is being divided um, uh, by two to the tens, this many steps from the ADC. Does that make sense? Is that too boring? Does that make sense? That's how it got started, right? With the sensor. <clears throat> use uh, because you can you can use Arduino to read a digital value, and that value will be something from zero to ten twenty three. Right, if you pull it to the end and uh, adjust the potential meter to just to give you 1023, and then you, you are ready to measure it, everything. Just start moving the core, and you are getting all different values, and every um, LSB change will be something like this. Right, it's 97.66 uh, micrometer change on uh, displacement. String gauge, it's a force or pressure sensor. It's uh, all these metal wires being printed on the same field. And we're going to do some experiments with string gauges. So it's nothing but a resistor. Right? It looks like different, like, like IC chip or something, high technology, but it's nothing but a, just wires. And the wires has a resistance. And whenever it's being deformed, 
the resistance of this resistor will be changed so you can measure that across these two terminals. But the thing is, uh, resistance change is tiny. It's usually less than, I don't know, 0 0.01 ohms or something. And the range of the change is not too big as well. So we need a sensor to sense it. So it's called Western Wheatstone Bridge. Wheatstone Bridge. And I bought a lot of these low cells. So these, uh, you couldn't see it, but actually the string gauge is being inserted into the low cell. If you directly buy a, a, string, a string gauge, you can purchase it from Amazon. It's not expensive at all. But the thing is, if you want to use a string gauge directly, for example, I, I, since I know that if you look at this circuit, um, yeah, let's start from here. <clears throat> so build a bridge first. How the bridge works? You have to do some calculations. It's going to be on the homework as well. So you want to understand how to calculate it. <clears throat> All right. So there are three types of with stone bridges. The first one is called a quarter bridge. Quarter bridge. And here's the excitation signal, excitation signal called Vx. The ground here as V1, as V2. And it's sensing the delta V between these two nodes in order to find out the resistance change of the string gauge. So, for example, these are Rs. And this one has a little change. The reason is these Rs are just resistors, but this resistor is a string gauge. And it's being plugged in to the low cell. So it's a sensor, right? This guy is a sensor. All the other ones are just resistors. That's a quarter bridge. The quarter bridge means it only has one resistor. One of the four resistors is, is a sensor, but all the other ones are just resistors. So delta V equals to so V2 minus v, V1 as a voltage difference. And because this is a voltage divider circuit, what is V2? But just looking at this part, what is V2? What is VO? VO is a voltage across R2. So VO over R2 is I, right? And it has the same I. So VI over R1 plus R2 is also I. So they are equal to each other. So VO equals to VI times R2 over R1 plus R2. Circuit one. Stuff. As a voltage divider, why? Because this guy, keep in mind, just remember this, right? So in this simple linear circuit, the voltage share, the voltage share of each resistor equals to the resistance share. Why? Because if you move this here and move this back, so VO over VI, equals to R2 
over R1 plus R2. Is that correct? VO is a voltage across R2. And that's the voltage share because VO is a voltage across R2. VI is the entire voltage. So that's the voltage share of R2, the voltage. And R2 is a resistance R2, and that's the entire resistance. So that's why the voltage share equals to the resistance share. And that's the voltage divider theory, right? So come back to here. Just look at this point. Look at this, the right-hand side. What is V2? Mm -hmm. That's V2. What's V1? What is V1? Mm -hmm. So what is that? Yes. Okay, and then Vx and then Right? Cancelled, cancelled. And if you have experimented with the string gauges, you will find out actually the voltage change is tiny. The reason we can cancel this guy is because compared to this one, this is negligible. Because the R's are K ohms, and these ones are like 0.1 ohms change or something. So delta R compared to this one is nothing. So you can directly ignore it. All right. Okay, so we'll look into half bridge and full bridge on Wednesday and other sensors as well on Wednesday. Okay. See you on Wednesday. Um, yes. Yeah, it will be a bit larger. But it depends on the direction you bend it. If you bend it the other direction, then delta will be make negative. It won't be negative. Ah, uh, can be negative. Yeah. Possible. <laughs>